Im Kräftespiel dieser Woche tauchen neben den gewohnten Abonnenten... A new face has emerged this week amongst the regular portrait gallery of political fame. The face of someone who is politically neutral is the face of a dead man. Lumumba has risen from the status of a powerful living prime minister to that of the assassinated hero of Africa. The body of an important personality. Here I have what's left of a very important historical figure. He had very good teeth. They're covered in gold at the back. How and why was Patrice Lumumba murdered 40 years ago? One man who must know is the Belgian colonial official and diplomat, Jacques Brassine. He was dangerous for us in the sense that he wasn't open to the kind of solutions we sometimes wanted to apply. Another man who played a central role in the fall of the Congolese politician was Louis Malière, a colonel in the Belgian Secret Service. Lumumba chose the wrong side. Of course, he was more or less a communist, and he chose the Russian side rather than the West. Virginia, USA. This is where CIA agent Larry Devlin lives. He was the man the American government entrusted with the murder of Lumumba. Lumumba was a danger for both the Congo and the rest of the world, in the sense that, in the sense that he, in the sense that he was allowing the Soviets to come in, and we were certainly believed that there was a very good chance that they would take over control of the Congo. Forty years after independence, the country with its huge Congo River is still being torn apart by civil war. Mobutu's long dictatorship plundered its riches and the mineral wealth so viciously fought over has dried up. Congo's Minister of Culture is the daughter of the country's first Prime Minister. Lumumba has become the symbol of nationalism in this country and has become the symbol of the struggle for independence. And since he also died a tragic death for his ideas, sacrificing himself to pursue those ideas to the very end, I think that is what he left us. And also, for years and years, we couldn't really talk about Lumumba. It was practically forbidden here. People need to know about him and what happened. It's their history, which isn't very old, only 40 years. There's this great desire to know the fathers of our independence, but they're not well enough known. Lumumba's house in Kinshasa, or Leopoldville as it was known then, in 1960, when the Congo became independent, it was for a few months at the center stage of world politics. Patrice Lumumba, the country's first prime minister. The masses who are waiting for us tomorrow want more than just the votes they have obtained today. They want bread and progress. We need to be able to build this nation. There were headlines throughout the entire summer. 200 days later, the show was over. Roland, Lumumba's younger son, was not even three years old when he saw his father for the last time. We must know exactly who did it, how and why. We have the right to know. It's our duty to pass this knowledge on to the future generations, to our children and the children of our children. Lumumba's typewriter, a souvenir from the only friend he had in Belgium, Jean Van Lied, a rebellious Christian and anti-colonialist. He tried in vain to act as an intermediary between Lumumba and the Belgian government. Patrice était tellement un homme libre 
Patrice was such a free man, and people found it so original to see a black man who didn't lick the feet of the colonialists that they instinctively perceived him as a threat. And it was that freedom of his which turned him into a kind of meteorite flashing through the sky, and then he disappeared. The first Europeans to arrive in the Congo called it the Heart of Darkness. In 1955, when King Baudouin visited the country, the colonial order still seemed secure. But millions of Congolese had paid with their lives during the 80 years of Belgian rule. The chance appearance of Patrice Lumumba in the background of an old newsreel. Within five years, this unknown post office worker had become the leader of an unstoppable independence movement. The objective we are pursuing is the liberation of the Congo from the colonial regime and the total emancipation of the country. We are certain that we know exactly where we are going. The independence of the Congo doesn't mean driving the Belgians out or breaking with Belgium. Quite the opposite. We want to form a sovereign government, which will provide a place for everyone in a country where Congolese and Belgians will be able to work hand in hand in the service of the Congolese nation. Lumumba, the Pan-African with his MNC party, won a surprise victory in the first free elections. The Belgians reluctantly handed over the government to him. His closest rival, Kasavubu, became president of the young independent states. We are honored to present to the parliament of the Congo the first Congolese government, as follows. Prime Minister and Minister of Defense, your humble servant, Lumumba. The first clash came at the independence celebrations. Gentlemen, the independence of the Congo is the crowning moment of the mission conceived by the genius of King Leopold II, undertaken by him with courageous tenacity and pursued with great perseverance by Belgium. King Baudouin made a speech in which he exalted the role of Belgium, talking about everything Belgium had brought to the Congo. He said we had arrived at a moment when Belgium had decided to grant the Congo its independence and that this was well and good. I would say it was a classic speech for such circumstances. Kazavubu made a speech thanking King Baudouin. He talked about the Congo and the future. It was a good speech, too. Lumumba hadn't been scheduled to speak. The whole international press was there. Suddenly he got up, walked to the tribune, and made a speech. Lumumba's speech came as a shock. Nobody was expecting it, and it shocked lots of Belgians. He systematically condemned Belgian colonization. He repeated all the harshest anti-colonial accusations. We'd cut off people's hands, we'd enslaved them, and all that sort of thing. You who have fought for independence and are today victorious, I salute you in the name of the Congolese government. I salute all my friends who fought relentlessly at our sides. We have been subjected to insults and sarcasms, to the blows we had to endure from morning to night just because we were Africans. We learned that the law was never the same according to whether it was applied to whites or blacks. Who will ever forget the shootings or the barbarous jail cells awaiting those who refuse to submit to this regime of injustice, oppression and exploitation? That was really the decisive moment when he made that famous speech on the 30th of June 1960. A lot of people then said he signed his death warrant with that speech because the Belgian government didn't want him. 
not just because of the 30th of June speech, but because he was Patrice Lumumba, and he didn't fit in with the hopes of the Belgians and Americans and many people in business. Only five days after the founding of the new state, a revolt broke out in the army. The black troops rebelled against their Belgian officers, who had no intention of abandoning their command. Crisis in the Congo took over the headlines in the world's press. In diesem Wagen wurde der italienische Konsul in Leopoldville ermordet. The Italian consul in Leopoldville was murdered in this car. Terror and destruction are now the features of a freedom which many believe to be premature. Whites are fleeing mobs who have been whipped up to anger. The Belgian government is sending paratroops into the Congo. In the copper-rich province of Katanga, Lumumba's opponent, Chombi, called on the Belgians for help too, in order to disarm the troops. Less than 10 days after their withdrawal, colonial soldiers triumphantly returned to the former colony. René Small went to Katanga as an officer in the military secret service. If it hadn't been for the courage of that small number of Belgian officers and NCOs in containing the blacks and preventing them from overrunning the town, then it would have been horrible. The Elizabethville mutiny was over in 24 hours thanks to the Belgians. The rebellion started on July 9th and lasted till the 10th. It was on the 11th, at 5 p.m., that we declared independence. This was the Katangan secession. Chombi, known locally as Mr. Cash Register, declared himself president of the separatist province. But he was a president installed by the Belgians. Elizabethville was above all a center for important financial interests. That was where the Union Minière, the mining company, was. Obviously, Belgian financial circles also wanted to keep their hands on that. One of the major figures in the breakaway state was the Minister of Finance, Jean-Baptiste Kibwe. As soon as we took over, the mining company, l'Union Minière, continued to export copper and the revenue from this went into the Katanga National Bank. Chombi's chief aide was a Belgian lawyer, Jacques Bartelous. The mining company now paid its taxes and license fees to the Katangan government, not to Leopoldville. So the Katangans had plenty of money, and this enabled them to equip the Katangan gendarmes and buy weapons and armored vehicles. There were arms merchants continually visiting Chombi's home to try and sell him arms. Chombi's white mercenaries defending the free world in the heart of Africa soon became known as les affreurs, literally the dreadful men. There was anger and disappointment at the breakaway in the Congolese capital, Leopoldville. The flag over the Belgian embassy was hauled down and the ambassador of the former colonial power sent home. The plot was all ready and the plans prepared. They intend to impose a government against the wishes of the people. Belgium wants to balkanize this country, to break up the Congo. Lumumba asked that American troops come in to replace the Belgians and throw the Belgians out. Uh, they talked to Ambassador Timberlake, who realized that if American troops came in, almost certainly then Russian troops would come in. So Timberlake then recommended that instead of 
asking the United States that they ask the United Nations to send uh, troops to to uh, resolve the situation. At the request of the Congolese government, the UN has decided to replace Belgian troops with United Nations forces. In this way, the US representative Cabot Lodge has opposed Soviet attempts to make propaganda capital out of the Congo crisis. This was a contrick on a big scale. American planes were hastily resprayed and flew the blue helmets into the Congo. Lumumba and his government had called for UN troops in order to end the Katanga secession. But when they arrived, they took no action against Chombi and the separatists. The Indian General Rikia went to the Congo as military advisor to UN Secretary General Dag Hammarskjöld. Unfortunately, Mr. Lubumba and uh, Mr. Kasuhubu, or for that matter, any other Congolese leader, which uh, belonged to one side or the other, their, their impression was totally wrong of how they were to use the UN. They expected the United Nations to behave as a big power like the United States does when it goes out to help a country. Mm -hmm. That they use force to help a country, they provide arms, equipment, intelligence, well, the United Nations is not designed for that purpose. As the population celebrated the arrival of UN troops in the Congo, the Soviet Prime Minister Nikita Khrushchev was holding out prospects of help from the Red Army for the Lumumba government. Lumumba tried to use the Soviet embassy as a means of exerting pressure on the Americans. Without any official invitation, he traveled to the USA and asked for support against the Belgian intervention. But the jungle premier, as he was pejoratively called, wasn't even received by the president. I wish to convey to the entire American people a message of friendship from the Congolese people, who have great faith in you. We want you to understand us and help us. And we want you to know that when your technicians and teachers come to our country, you will find in the Congolese people friends and brothers. African leaders were new to us. A man such as Lumumba did not have the sophistication or the polish, if you will, of the normal German or French or Belgian, English, what have you, diplomat. Uh, he tended to say things very bluntly, and which upset, uh, I think, the Western nations. The international success of the Katanga secession led to the breakaway of another province. The diamond-producing region of South Kasai withdrew from the central government. Lumumba decided to stop the disintegration of the Congolese state without the help of the West. The major problem for any offensive was how to transport his troops to a front 1,000 kilometers away. Since we were not giving him the aircraft, he managed to get some aircraft from the Russians. This military operation was relatively successful, but Lumumba had signed his own death sentence a second time. Now it was the Americans who wanted rid of him. The United States deplores the unilateral action of the Soviet Union in supplying aircraft and other equipment for military purposes to the Congo, thereby aggregate, aggravating an already serious situation which finds Africans killing other Africans. I had a little man at the airport, and if a white person got off a Soviet aircraft, he was considered Russian. Now, he could have been Czech, he could have been Bulgarian, because they had some Bulgarians and some Czechs there. But more likely, he was right. And the man would go, one, two, three, four, cross. One, two, three, four, cross. And at the end of the day, we would count these figures. So it was an approximation when I say a 1,000. But they came in, and we were afraid that they would slowly take over the, po the levers of power. Were you in contact with the Americans? Yes, my contact was Larry Devlin. We got on very well and we did some things together. 
But I think the Americans wanted to liquidate Lumumba. Oh, yes, Colonel Malier was uh, in the defense section with the... Uh, he was a highly respected officer. Uh, he somehow understood Congolese probably better than 98% of his colleagues and certainly better than I did. One day it was agreed with our people that we would put listening devices in the Mumba's office. The Americans provided the equipment and the Belgians installed it. We intercepted all of Lumumba's telephone conversations. The big difficulty was that he often spoke in Tetela, and we had to have a translator. That was the biggest difficulty. Was this useful? We knew in general what he was saying and what he was doing. Through a series of press conferences, Lumumba tried in vain to win over world public opinion. He exposed the foreign intervention which was attempting to undermine the new independent Congo, but the press branded him as a threat to world interests and set about the assassination of his character. Reports from the German correspondent Peter Scholl Latour were typical of the style used in the Western press. Is it his Mephistopheles beard, or those eyes rolling like billiard balls behind his spectacle lenses? There's something terrifying about this man. He has the head of an African Lenin. Lumumba's daughter, Juliana, was present at many of the press conferences. I was with my father all the time. Often I was the only person allowed to be with him when he was working on his speeches. So I'd sit down quietly and just be with Dad. In the Belgian press, he was shown as Satan, with horns and everything, the archetypal communist. And all this just because he said things which corresponded to the aspirations of the majority of the people, but which were absolutely not part of the mindset or the objectives of the colonial power at the time. He wanted the black people, the Congolese people, first and foremost, to be worthy of their own culture. He had faith in them. We want to be independent, he said, but on terms of equality and respect. I think that's why people always said he was intransigent. Are you a communist, Miss Lumumba? It always makes me laugh when I'm asked that question. I'm not a communist at all. You know, I've often been presented as a communist, as anti-white, anti-Belgian, as someone destructive. Absolutely not. I'm simply a nationalist leader fighting for an ideal. I'm not a communist at all. I never will be. American agent Larry Devlin received $100,000 from the CIA along with instructions to make the elimination of Lumumba the priority goal of his covert action. Yes, I received a cable that uh, someone whom I would, a senior officer that I would know by sight, would arrive and give me specific instructions. Uh, and that, that was very surprising because why were they sending someone there to give me instructions when they could send them by cable? I had no idea what the instructions would be. In Belgian Secret Service telegrams, there was talk of a mysterious Operation Barracuda and of the imminent arrival of two children. I must say quite sincerely that I have no recollection of the code name Barracuda at all. And the two children, what was that? The two children? No. Yes, yes, I remember now. They sent two people, an aide and Major Luz. They sent both of them. Yes, it must have been those two, to talk to me about the Lumumba affair, and they were in favor of eliminating him. I remember being totally surprised when he instructed me that they wanted to get rid of Lumumba, I, I, I'd never heard of, our, of the agency being involved in such a thing before. They wanted to send me a crocodile killer to get rid of Lumumba. That's what they came to propose. 
Ils sont venus me proposer ça. Substance to, to eliminate Lumumba uh, was toothpaste that was poisoned, which would result in a illness very similar to polio or something like that, as I remember. I never opposed it. I always let them get on with things, but I let the Congolese do it. I think there were lots of people who preferred him out of the way for good. It's been denied that President Eisenhower issued such instructions. I have no idea whether he did or did not. At the time, I assumed that he had. And I, I, I have a feeling that something must have been said that was either he ordered it or he was misunderstood. But certainly, I, under, I believed it at the time, that it was a presidential order. The red flag came down when the Congolese army in Leopoldville overthrew the ultranationalist Prime Minister Patrice Lumumba and expelled Moscow's diplomatic representative from the country. With Soviet documents, fly sheets and propaganda brochures burned, communist intrigues against the United Nations in the Congo have for the time being been stopped. A 30-year-old colonel, Desire Mobutu, has become the new strongman of this young republic with the support of the majority of the Congolese army. Mobutu had in fact been a trusted ally of Lumumba, who had appointed him head of the army only a few weeks earlier. He now declared he had deposed the prime minister. The officer who led the putsch was in fact the West's secret weapon against Lumumba. One of his most influential advisors was the Belgian counter-espionage officer, Colonel Malier. Mobutu was pro-Western, that's for sure. But apart from that, he was also manipulated by the Americans. He was interested in dealing with the United States and having American support. And I was the, the person with whom he worked. Mobutu's putsch was the prelude to a dictatorship lasting more than 30 years, from which the country has never recovered. But Mobutu didn't do it on his own. He was helped. They came to take this country's wealth. They came to get contracts with him so they could fill their pockets and to get bigger and bigger royalties. They supported him for more than 30 years. The Americans, the Belgians, the French and the big international companies. They didn't come to develop the country. They came to make a profit and they made huge profits. Mobutu's move against Lumumba was not only supported by Western secret services, but also by the United Nations. It was a million dollars, roughly, uh, which was UN money, which was used to pay the troops. Using troops paid by foreign powers Mobutu put Lumumba under house arrest. UN forces also surrounded the residence of the deposed Prime Minister to protect him, but also to eliminate him politically. Lumumba broke the siege and tried to take his family on the 2,000 kilometre drive to Stanleyville, where a pro-Lumumba counter-government had been formed but his very popularity was to become his undoing. We understood it was to be like a normal official trip, so we mobilized the population in the usual way. He made a speech in every village. Even in those villages which didn't support him, he would make speeches. He was caught in a trap of his own making. He wanted to win people over and he was quite capable of doing so. But this dragged out the journey and they were able to catch up with him and put him in prison. Late in the evening of the 1st of December 1960, Lumumba crossed the Sankuru River by boat and appeared to have reached safety but the ferry boat bringing his family also brought his pursuers. At 
the last moment, Lumumba managed to escape by driving to a UN position. The UN troops from Ghana had always been on his side, but this time the door stayed shut. Any intervention on behalf of the fugitive had been explicitly forbidden by headquarters. We had only agreed to provide him protection in the house. Yeah. If he wanted to go out, then he had to tell us he's going out, where he's going, how he's going, then we would have to decide how we are going to protect him. Two days later, at Leopoldville Airport, Mobutu had told the international press to come to the airport. Photographers and camera crews from the West were to witness the abuse and humiliation of the great Lumumba. We took him to Taisville, where he was guarded by Bobozo. And then one day we said he was trying to escape, and that's when Nendaka took things in hand to get him sent somewhere else. Victor Nendaka had once been a close friend of Lumumba's, his representative at the head of the party. Now he became Mobutu's security chief, responsible for capturing his former party comrades. On the 13th of January, there was what you would call a mutiny at the military camp. The army was divided. There were pro-Lumumba and anti-Lumumba factions. General Barboza said to Mobutu, I can't guarantee his security anymore, you'll have to take him off my hands. Put him wherever you like, but he must leave this camp because I can no longer vouch for the troops stationed in Thizville. We alerted everyone we could and said, be careful, he's quite capable of coming back to Leopoldville with the tanks from Tisville, because he was capable of stirring up the troops and getting them behind him. Everyone was given their assignment. Mine was to go to Tisville, get the prisoners, and from there, take them to Moanda. It was only when we were in the plain that Lumumba realized what was really going on. Two of Lumumba's close political allies were also on board. Ministers Mopolo and Okito, who were also to share his fate. I wasn't interested. I washed my hands of it. And that was that. The destination of this carefully planned trip was Katanga, where Lumumba's deadly enemy was waiting for him. I was told to ask Chombe if he would take delivery of the parcel. Malia used the Belgian Secret Service's radio connections for his secret message. But who did he speak to? Commander Fedict. He was the one who answered. The first message, which I received at the end of the morning, was a message which had clearly come from Colonel Malia, saying, request agreement from the Jew to receive Satan. Yes, those were code words. We didn't speak openly. The Jew in my coded language was Chombe. And Satan for Lumumba. And let me point out that these code words were chosen by Colonel Malier and not by myself. For us, Lumumba was Satan. And he did look satanical. You just have to look at those eyes. And Chombe was the Jew. Why? <laughs> Mr. Cash Register. <laughs> Even the government in Brussels sent a telegram requesting that Chombi take charge of the prisoners. So the aircraft landed at Katanga's airport. We were there when Lumumba and the two others got off the plane. And it wasn't a pleasant sight. They put the three of them in a jeep and that was when I realized it was Lumumba, who I had already seen before independence. They had shaved his beard off, he was tied up and all that. There were three of them, 
They struck me, Lumumba anyway, as very dignified, or shall we say, fatalistic. It's difficult to describe. They were being propped up, but they seemed very tired. The airfield was occupied by Swedish UN troops. They were there and saw the whole business. The Swedish unit was in the control tower. One of them, Sergeant Kelgren, made a very brief report describing the arrival of the prisoners. Yes, we did have a report on his arrival and immediately report instructions were given that we, you must watch him, you must insist that uh, he, no bodily harm is done. The prisoners were taken to an empty private house belonging to a Belgian settler not far from the airport. It was here at the Villa Brouet that they were guarded by military police under Belgian command. There were many witnesses to the events which followed. I saw several members of the Katanga government, including the interior minister, Mr. Monongo, who looked Lumumba over from head to foot and back again, and then spat on the ground. When I saw that, I said to myself, Lumumba has got his death sentence. After the visit from the interior minister, Manongo, we were ordered to shoot at the UN troops if they came. And if we couldn't prevent them getting in, we were to kill Lumumba. Didn't you feel any pity for him? Why should I? I have no pity for him. He insulted our king. Didn't it upset you a bit? Upset? A man's death doesn't leave you indifferent, but upset? No. I said to Chombe, his fate is sealed. Lumumba's fate is sealed. It's as sealed as if he was already dead. I'm sure of that. And in that case, they may as well execute him at Bakwanga as at Elizabethville. But there he was in the hands of the blacks. They were in the hands of the black government. So the discussion was not about whether to save Lumumba. The only discussion was about where to kill him. Yes. To put it in plain words, that was the issue. They wanted to kill them all. They said, if we don't kill him, we'll have more trouble. It was Munongo and Kibwe, the hardliners in the Katanga government, whose point of view won the day. And their line was Lumumba's arrival in Katanga means he must be put to death. The government met and decided Lumumba would be killed. They had a lot to drink during that cabinet meeting, and they had a lot more to drink afterwards. They took them to the presidency, to Chombe's residence. It was already evening, about 8 o'clock, 8.30, and from the presidency they went to the place where they were executed. And this is where the execution took place. They stood the condemned man up against that tree. Why didn't the Belgian officers refuse to take part? Ah, oh, that's a good question. The Belgian officers were on detachment to Katanga. They carried out the orders they received from the authorities they had been seconded to. We dug a hole and we put them in front of it. We shot them and they fell into the hole. This is the tree they were stood up against. And here are the famous bullet holes. Here you can see them a bit better. The bullets, of course, went right through their bodies before lodging themselves in this tree. For me, the business with Lumumba started the morning after the execution. The man in charge, the Belgian, 
called me into his office and said, okay, are you going to take care of this? And I said, all right, but what do I have to do? The Katangans denied he was dead. They denied everything. It was absolutely crazy. We cut the bodies up into pieces. They were buried twice. We cut them up into pieces, we burned them, and we also had huge quantities of acid, like you have in car batteries. So most of each body was dissolved. And then the rest, we burned them. But we had to do all this without the black scene, in the middle of the forest. That was a problem too. There were two of us, just the two, and we had to do all that on our own, get the three bodies out of the ground, cut them into pieces and destroy them, and nobody was to know about it, and nobody did, nobody knew what happened. Uh, there were all kinds of stories about Lumumba's death. He was supposed to have escaped, stolen a car, been killed by some villagers who recognized him. But nobody believed any of that for a second. Even the Belgian minister for Africa, one of those pulling the strings behind the scenes, contributed to the cover-up with false telegrams. I went there the next day. As soon as I arrived at the airport, I was told he was dead. I wonder how you reacted to this news. What was your reaction? Oh, I said, good riddance. What else would you expect me to say? For you, it was the kind of solution of all problems? Yes. He was happy. Happy, uh, not, not perhaps the word, you're, you're busy. <laughs> Here's one problem gone, now what's the next problem? Three weeks later, the story was Lumumba and his accomplices massacred by villagers. Just one of countless lies. The whole truth only came to light ten years later. None of the murderers or the men behind them has ever been indicted. Lumumba wrote a last letter from prison. I often remember a sentence from that letter which said, to my children whom I'm leaving. To my children who I'll never see again, I'd like to say Congo has a magnificent future. Tell them the future of Congo will be magnificent and that he expects them, as he expects of every Congolese, to do their sacred duty. There are even people who believe he will return. Now he'll have to come back with two front teeth missing. <laughs> You're Europeans. I think this image, and I'm not Jewish, I'm black, recalls the Holocaust. Their bodies were burned. Their body fat was used as fertilizer. Their gold teeth were taken as war booty. And that's called a crime against humanity. It's as simple as that. <laughs>